doesn't it feel good after a long day where you walk into your home and things are just put away? They're where they're supposed to be. There aren't dishes piling out onto the countertop because the sink is full. There isn't clothing lying around everywhere. Things are just where they're supposed to be. My friends, if you're a neat freak, clean freak, you're going to love this. If your mom has called you a slob in the past, (laughs) well, listen up, because we're talking about the first Niyama Saucha. So you've been to a few or maybe many yoga classes and you are hooked. Somehow you feel better, kinder, more connected to yourself and those around you. Your friends view you as a hippie now and your parents, well, they think it's a phase. Regardless, when you are on your mat, you are home. Yoga teachers and students, come learn how yoga can help you navigate the daily grind, breakups, your anxiety from a place of clarity and compassion. Welcome to the Modern Yogi Podcast, hosted by me, Laura Siljander. Misfits, earthlings, yogis, take a deep breath, check in to see how you're doing, body, mind, and soul, because you have arrived. Okay, so if you've been following along, you know that we're supposed to have a Black Lives Matter interview. However, unfortunately, our schedules would not link up and I wasn't able to do it with the yoga teacher I originally wanted to do it with. So, back to the drawing board. This will happen in the right time, but I'm making a second call. Are there any black yoga teachers out there who are willing to do an interview just to answer some questions about how we can live our yoga practice to support the Black Lives Matter movement? And I've got some do and don't questions for white people. I want to know so we can be allies, so we can all support this movement together. So if you know of anyone, DM me, practice underscore compassion, or website lauracillagander.com. All right, so we are in the middle of our Eight Limbs of Yoga series from Patanjali. Let's review. There was a group or a guy named Patanjali, and he or they wrote the Yoga Sutras. Something that came out of the Yoga Sutras are or were the Eight Limbs of Yoga. The first two, the Yamas and Niyamas, are lifestyle. We have just finished up the yamas, the regulations. So we had something called ahimsa, which is not harming, satya, which is living your truth. There's a steya, which is not stealing or not living from that place of scarcity. Brahmacharya, which is don't let sex get in the way of your spiritual practice. And aparigraha, letting stuff go, not being too attached to outcomes and stuff. And we went over all of those. So if you're interested in any of those topics, re-listen or listen for the first time. But now we're moving into the niyamas. And there are another five of these. These are called the observances or really how to conduct yourself, how to be your best self. (laughs) So think about this. If you're a Christian, you know about the Ten Commandments. So this is sort of like those 10 ethical foundations to build your spiritual practice on. If you've done any Buddhist psychology courses, classes, readings, you'll know that there are 10 virtuous ways to live your life too. So how cool is this? These three different processes, spiritual paths that all have 10 items of how can we set the foundation for our spiritual practice? It's a beautiful way to start. So it's what is really interesting is I've had a lot of episodes with you on this series, at least five. This is a six. And we have not talked yet about what people really think yoga is, the postures or even breathing. We haven't gotten to any of that yet. So you can practice yoga, not on the mat, but off the mat all the time, which is super cool. Because you'll know that people say like, oh, I'm not flexible, I can't do yoga, or I'm not strong enough, I can't do yoga. You're like, well, can you be compassionate? That's yoga. It's really a neat practice. On the mat, off the mat, it gets us closer and closer to peace. Because face it, life can be really hard, really challenging, and you're not really sure how to navigate it. That's why this foundation is there, to give you some clarity in times of hardship, in times of pain, in times of suffering. So... Let's talk about the niyamas. There are five. They are known to be the observances. That didn't make a lot of sense to me. So it's how to treat yourself, how to take care of ourselves. And the first one we're going to go over is saucha. Saucha, 
cleanliness or purity. For some reason, the color white comes to mind when I think Saucha. So cleanliness or purity of your mind, of your body, and your environment. So let's start with your bod. And what is interesting with this is there are two very extreme thoughts on the body and the spiritual practice. Let's talk about the West first, where we live. We glorify the body. I talked about this in Brahmacharya a little bit about how our currency is beauty. You want to get more followers. You want to get the right spouse. You want the attention. Beauty is currency. Your looks, your body, your clothes, how you're perceived is currency. And we glorify that here. Almost to, I don't see anything except for the way you look. Like, I don't see your heart. I don't see your soul. I don't see your kindness because I'm too focused on your outfit. (laughs) or too focused on your six-pack. If you have cute outfits in a six-pack, I'm not dinging you. But in the West, you know that we can get super obsessed with losing the last five pounds or the perfect outfit or the right color hair. We can get obsessed with this. But then there's this opposite end of the spectrum where spiritual leaders will almost disregard the body. Like it's not a big deal. Like I was reading the Bhagavad Gita, which is taking me forever to get through. (laughs) It's so rich. I have to take it like one verse at a time. And even the Bhagavad Gita, like they really disregard the human body because spiritual teachers, spiritual practitioners will sometimes focus so much on the soul. The soul will live on in heaven or the soul will be reincarnated to someone or something else. And they really disregard like, why would you mourn a dead body? Because the soul will live on. And it's almost like, whoa, that's hard to wrap my head around. So do you see these like two really different thought processes? So I'm going to try to bring this more in the middle, more common ground here. The body, keeping your body clean through ordinary means. (laughs) If you're dirty, take a shower, brush your teeth. (laughs) And I laugh and we laugh at saying this, but I'm going to go on and say the body is the home for the soul. So honor the body by keeping it healthy. This is not only an act of kindness and love and ahimsa towards yourself, but a spiritual act to keep the soul's home pure and stable. I hope that makes sense. This is what I teach my yoga students. And you'll see this a lot. I see it a lot with Christians, not to compare like Christianity and yoga too much because yoga is definitely not a religion, but just think about them more as a spiritual ways. The Christians want to get to heaven. The yogis want peace and enlightenment. Okay, so think about it like that. If you're a Christian, can you think about all the overweightness in the Christian church? These really, really spiritual people that let their bodies go. Type 2 diabetes, heart disease, all the things. How are we supposed to live our spiritual life if our soul's home is breaking down? How does that work? So by neglecting this body, this earthly fleshly body that we are in, which has this really divine, good soul inside, we've got to keep it going. So asana or the postures to treat your body in a way that is sustainable and appropriate. So keeping your body strong and agile by stretching, by doing your asanas. And we can get kind of out of hand here in the West, become really obsessed with just the postures. Talking to you power yogis, I was definitely, definitely one of them. If we just stick with asanas, if we just stick to postures, that's good. That'll get us closer to peace. But that can, I believe, only take us so far. So we need to treat our bodies in a way that is sustainable. If you had a long, hard day, and then you go have a long, hard practice, and have followed by another long, hard day, and another long, hard practice, you're going to experience burnout. Maybe you need to balance your long, hard day with a yin class or a restorative class. Or maybe you do need that hard, hot yoga class to burn off some steam. Just keep that in mind that to treat your body and your yoga classes in a way that is sustainable. Now, if you're also adding in like jogging or surfing or biking or rock climbing or whatever, that's also a way to keep your body healthy through exercise. Cleanliness of your body through eating as well is something that our yoga practice is asking us to take a look at. So eating is extremely personal. However, what you eat directly affects your body and your mind. I mean, think about it. When you get hangry, you just get kind of cranky. I turn into a Krabby Kelly. No one wants to be around me. I don't even want to be around me. (laughs) So what you eat affects your mind for sure. So Sausha refers to eating a way that is nourishing, giving your body what it needs to get you through the day. 
Also consider your diet in a way that is compassionate, compassionate to the environment and thinking of it as a way of of being compassionate towards the people and all of the beings it took for you to get that food on your plate or bowl. I mean, think about it. If you're sitting there with your salad, that lettuce had to be planted and then that seed needed to be watered and cared for and then grown and then plucked by someone. And then it had to be put on a truck to get to whatever manufacturing plant where they put it in bundles. And then that was put on a truck to get to the grocery store. And then the grocery store to your house. And now you're preparing the lettuce for your plate. All of those beings, all of those processes, the the drivers, the farmers, the people who stocked it in the grocery store, the people who rung you up at the grocery store, all of those people had to be involved with just getting the lettuce on your plate. So next time, maybe it's a fun practice to look down at what you're eating and to think, wow, how many beings it took for this to get in my bowl or on my plate. So that's a cool way to look at it as well. So Soucha through your food. What do you need that's nourishing to your body? I'm studying Ayurveda right now in a class, and a lot of it has to do with food. If you don't know what Ayurveda is, it's a sister science of yoga and its lifestyle as well. And there's a lot of ways to eat Ayurvedically. So if that's something you're interested in, look it up or let me know and I can try to get someone on the podcast to talk about it. Also, Sauchet talks about, all right, we have our body, move the body, nourish the body, but now also our minds, (laughs) our wild monkey minds, keeping our mind clean and pure through meditation and breath practices or pranayamas. So this is a really beautiful way to address our monkey minds and If we don't bring some sort of regulation, if we don't bring some sort of attention to our minds, they're going to go everywhere. They're going to bounce to one thing, to another. It's going to be disorganized. You're going to start to believe some of the weird thoughts that you have are actually your thoughts. When you sit in your meditation and when you make time for your meditations and just simple breath awareness practices, this helps your mind become more pure, more clean. So that's a way to do it that way. Even through asana, have you went to a yoga class and you lay in your shavasana afterwards and your mind just seems slower, quieter, clear. So you can also get this through your asana practice. Your asana practice is like a two for one. (laughs) It's a bogo. Buy one, get one. But also keeping your environment clean and pure. (laughs) Some of you are kind of cringing. Some of you are like, yes. (laughs) Let's start with this. This is one you're probably not expecting. The people you choose to spend your time with are your roommates, are your friends. Are they pushing you to be a better person? Are they encouraging behaviors and patterns that you know that if you sat with that, you know, this isn't getting you anywhere. What I am saying is, are the people around you toxic? Are they causing you stress and drama? Are they negative? Or are they positive people? They want to be better human beings. They want to engage in that space of goodness that we've talked about in the past, the sacred space within us. Do they encourage you to be positive? Do they encourage you to be better? Keeping your spaces orderly, (laughs) not spotless. I'm not saying like I'm coming in with a white glove. This is a military inspection and I'm coming to make sure everything is dust free. (laughs) But orderly, just orderly. Things are, you know, where they should be for the most part. To think of it as an act to help purify your environment, like washing your dishes instead of leaving them out, cleaning your shower, things like that. Think If you can think about, look, I'm trying to keep my place pure and clean so my mind can stay pure and clean. An interesting thought process sometimes when I see a friend's house and it's in complete disarray. Sometimes I wonder if that's a reflection of what's going on in their head. So your environment can definitely be a window into what's happening behind the curtains. (laughs) Just implementing one of these small tasks can help with mental clarity. I mean, think about walking into a house where things are put away versus a house that has stuff everywhere. Sometimes I really don't like cleaning up. I just don't want to do it. Just don't want to do it. And I especially don't like dishes, but sometimes to make myself do it, to make me do these tasks, it's like, look, I am trying to purify my environment so I can keep my environment, my mind, and my body pure and clean. My soul lives my body. My body lives in this house. Let's keep it tidy. And sometimes that'll be enough to say, all right, I'll do the dishes. (laughs) 
This is Saucha. Again, cleanliness of the body, cleanliness of the mind, cleanliness of the people you're around and your environment. This is the first Niyama. What do you think? Do you like it? <laughs> oh, the Niyamas are awesome. Implement one of these, y'all, this week. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Let me know how it goes if you'd like. All right, so now with a little bit more understanding, remember, remember, remember to practice that compassion of your mind through your saucha, maybe through your ahimsa. Practice compassion with your speech. Remember your compassionate actions. Keep that body pure. Keep that environment pure. Keep the people around you someone who you want to be around. Have a great week. Namaste. Shalom. Pure Vida. you're still here well if you want some yoga practices i have a youtube channel called the modern yogi you look it up on youtube you will find it i've got some really beginner yoga practices on there full classes and really beginner meditations all for free i even have a yoga nidra on there so you can get into your jammies grab your teddy bear and just yoga nidra it out it's a great nighttime nap time situation <laughs> It's all free. It's all resources for you. Again, they're more beginner stuff. Even if you're more advanced, have fun with it. Maybe add on some level two, three stuff if you'd like. But yeah, go subscribe if you want and check it out.